Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 21st day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. And uh, last month, a, another great Christian scandal erupted. Satan vomited forth and more stuff. Uh, sweep the church away. And I am familiar with how devastating such things can be to a church, whether it's small or large. And there's a pattern that seems to afflict particularly large ministries uh, and charismatics more than others, charismatic Pentecostals more than others, especially when they get to the, the, the Pentecostal being denominational it doesn't really happen so much until the ministry gets to the size that, uh, well, they're not afraid of the denomination anymore. They get too big for their britches. Uh, like uh, Jim Baker and Jimmy Swagger. I still remember, what was it, Swagger or Baker. I was driving down the road and heard the report of that over the radio, and was like, eh, you know, it was bad. At that time, I was halfway into that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, when you see things in person, I remember one summer we decided to take a trip. I said, well, why don't we go down to Louisiana? We can stop by uh, New Orleans and then stop by the Jimmy Swaggart uh, for his camp meeting period. Yeah, I got an eyeful there. I got an eyeful, I think, prior to that, we went out to the East Coast and decided to swing by the 700 Club. <laughs> Nothing but a TV set, a stage, complete with cue cards for the audience. I was not impressed. And a guard shack. Both of these places had armed guards. So much for Jesus Christ. He that takes up the sword shall perish by the sword. Yeah, uh, you'd think that God could provide an angel or something like that to watch over things. No, none of these outfits. These, you look at these outfits and you watch them over the years and you realize, hmm, who are they really serving? You know, how come, uh, how come uh, Jimmy Swigert uh, during the camp meeting where all these people, all his fans and people that watch his, his programs travel from all over the country down to his camp meeting and he shows up right before he has to talk in his Lincoln Continental. And then as soon as he's done speaking, he zips out the door. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, we took the tour of the place. <laughs> I was not happy with what I saw, by the way, in either place, 700 Club or there. So, yeah, I didn't ever, ever see... Uh, Jim Baker's amusement park. Something tells me Jesus wasn't involved in any of this stuff. It's all a manifestation of the flesh. All right, so I want to talk that this was has to do with Mike Bickle at IHOP, Kansas City. Uh, people that are, haven't been around the charismatic world, and I haven't looked at this stuff for years, thank God for that. As finally, brain is beginning to function halfway normally. This, this is this clouds your you know you get into this stuff, and it clouds your mind very much so, and you can't think clearly. You can't understand the scriptures, uh, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that, and the spirit that's at at work in those things is not the Holy Spirit. Uh, often it's demons, and I've had an encounter like that, and I decided to leave the room quickly. No, but all these other Christians, it was, well, I'll t I've, I've told that story before, but I think it's appropriate to repeat it now. I was just attending a, uh, a missionary institute to learn Spanish down on the Mexican border, uh, American side, and uh, it was led by some charismatics, uh, a guy that had been a missionary. He was in his 80s and been a missionary and most of his life down in Mexico. Uh, and I was in there, and they had... Uh, had brought up, if I had known better, I, I didn't know there was better ones available in the neighborhood. I would have gone there. But uh, the uh, 
uh, non-charismatic ones. But at that time, I was still sort of charismatic. Uh, but it, I, you know, it, it was this tongue speaking and stuff like that. And I was, it takes a while to figure out what's really going on with that stuff. It's not the Spirit of God. No, it's not. But what happened was they had a uh, a uh, minister, pastor from a local charismatic church, fairly large church, maybe a thousand members, uh, come in to speak. And he came in. He had gone to the Toronto Blessing or one of those revival centers and uh, picked up the spirit that was there and was going to impart it to the students. So I'm I'm sort of sitting in the back watching this and trying to trying to be an open minded about it. And said, so "What is this? You know, because I read some things about it, and I'm like, no, nah, this is this is not God." So I'm back there, uh, looking at what's going on and trying to discern what spirit is working there. And that dang thing spoke to me. I'm sitting there, and this thing, this demon, speaks into my mind words, words. Stop trying to discern me and submit. And as soon as I heard that, I knew exactly who I was dealing with or what I was dealing with it, and it was not the Spirit that brought me to Jesus Christ. And I quickly got up and left the room. I was not going to stay there, but the thing was, all these other students that were very much into the charismatic movement, they were up there doing the fall on the floor and flop around stuff. And they came back out, and they were saying, oh, that was so wonderful, that was so wonderful. And I'm thinking... I was thinking, you people don't know what you're messing with. That was, I didn't tell them because they wouldn't have heard it. They, w- they would not have listened. They were absolutely convinced that this was the Spirit of God, and it wasn't the Spirit of God at all. I know the Spirit of God, and that's not the, the Spirit of God does not sound like that. Stop trying to discern me and submit. No, that's not the Spirit of God at all, at all. So, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, but this this is a reoccurring pattern uh, with these especially large, charismatic, and generally independent, founded by a particular individual churches. Now, it happens in some other large churches, too, including uh, um, Jack Hiles Church that's up by, not, uh, where is that? In Indiana, just south of Chicago up there, which is another megachurch, Fundamental Baptist megachurch which has a whole lot of a history of abuse, sexual abuse, too. Uh, and it has to do with the idolatry of the leader. That's my take on this. So let's go over and look at a report. This is fairly recently. This is a, uh, a report coming out the 16th of November from Julie Royce. Now, Royce, uh, she has gone in the wrong direction, too. But she's a self-styled investigative reporter. She used to work for Moody in Chicago, uh, music, Mo- Moody Media, I don't know, I think on the radio part of it, and then she's in the Chicago area. But she has gone, focuses primarily on, uh, in her reports, pastoral abuse. She, she's done a whole investigative series of uh, Andy Wood, I don't know who that, John MacArthur, a whole bunch of articles on uh, Ra- uh, Ravi Zacharias. There's another another uh, not particularly, these two aren't particularly charismatic. Mark Driscoll, and he's out there doing it again. Hillsong, Bethel Baptist Church, College and Seminary, I don't know. James McDonald, Harvest, Liberty University. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, all these things are big guys. That's IHOP, Kansas, uh, Mike Bickle. That's Vineyard. They're related. Willow Creek Fe- Fellowship. Oh, yeah, there was another one. Uh, not charismatic, but uh, sort of a, uh, a secret sensitive, part of the main secret sensitive thing. Again, all around a central charismatic, not necessarily in the charismatic sense, but as a charismatic individual in the non-spiritual sense. Uh, Moody Bible Institute, (laughs) Wheaton College, Christianity Day. Oh, she's going after everything. ECFA? 
That's uh, that's supposed to be an accountability ministry. Calvary Chapel Evangelical Industrial Complex. Okay, I man, she's getting pretty broad feel, and and yet she's got somebody that she works with that is like nah. a notorious as as a liberal female character. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at this report here. So this will fill you in on the details a little bit. Uh, IH, uh, IHOP, Kansas City is what that stands for. I, report discounts Mike Bickle abuse. He's the head and founding pastor. That's a problem with all these things, including the non-charismatic ones and the Pentecostal ones, including... So just because you're in a denomination, if you're big enough, it doesn't matter. They came out with a report that said there wasn't enough physical evidence. The International House of Prayer, Kansas City, has just released a report on its initial findings, discounting some of the recent clergy uh, sexual abuse allegations made against its founder, Mike Bickle. The report also questions the true objectives of the complaint group, let me bring that up so it's a little bit larger. Which uh, presented the allegations to IHOP leadership in October. <laughs> this group, comprised of uh, former IHOP uh, leaders, IHOP Kansas City, published a statement October 28th saying that it became aware of numerous allegations of sexual abuse against uh, Bickle from credible women spanning several decades. Uh, you wonder, how could this go on for so long? I'll tell you. I'll tell you um, how this happens. Uh, God sometimes give me some, gives me some insight into these things, and I mean, and there's also spiritual discernment. It's, there, there are spiritual gifts that are operative. There's some, just some that aren't. Like discernment. I was like, why can't I stand that guy? It turns out later there's a good reason. However, the Holy Spirit just, ugh, I can't, the Holy Spirit couldn't stand the guy. Uh, however, I have... Uh, said in its report that it identified five of the eight women. Oh, boy. So you have the church that is the, that, that, that is the staff of the very ministry that abused you. And this, they're trying to identify who the accusers are. Uh, uh, the women, eight women, uh, the five of the eight women uh, the group claimed uh, are Bickle's victims. Three of the women have publicly called the allegations lies, the report stated. I wonder why. These are very abusive. It's like, uh, what's his name? Mark Driscoll uh, and others. In fact, just locally here, there's a church with a school. And during the time, partially during the time the current pastor was there, uh, the, the head of the school, I believe it was, uh, was involved in a like a four-year sexual thing with one of the boys up until the time he left to go to college. And then when he was in college, he finally confessed the whole thing after several attempted suicides. But, see, victims of these kind of things, just like the Catholic situation, which is horrendous, would you want to come out and identify yourself and go through all that pain of uh, in public disgrace and everything else. So obviously, I mean, it's like rapes and everything else. Most of them probably never are reported because it just brings much more suffering to the victim. And self-accusation, too, especially when you're accusing a religious, spiritual man of God or woman of God. We don't want to leave that out. Uh, so three of the women publicly called the allegations lies. Well, if you were outed, you might choose to deny that you were part of it too. Possibly. Especially if you did it, thought you were doing it anonymously. 
And then why would IHOP be seeking to identify the IHOP staff, whose job is to protect the pastor, <laughs> trying to be identify who these people are? Rather than, how can we handle this so we don't intimidate the victims? No, let's go intimidate the victims. Let's out them and expose them and let our people take care of them. That happens way too often. These things get cultish. Now, Bickle's IHOP, this is not a mainline uh, charismatic church. This is a fringe charismatic church. Bickle... And these kind of people are on the fringe, or you could say the, the avant-garde of the netherworld. Yeah, these are, these are um, and I'll talk about the nature of these, this kind of leadership in a little bit. Uh, the fourth has refused to, uh, reportedly refused to communicate with IHOP Casey's lawyer. Yeah, she's not stupid. Wonder why the lawyer from the pastor who abused you wants to communicate with you. <laughs> yeah, this is a, this is a valid in, in investigation, isn't it? One of the uh, woman's allegations predate IHOP Casey's founding. Well, Bickle's been around for a lot longer than that. So what? The accusations were against Bickle, not IHOP Bickle. The report said, and that so that makes it non-viable, and of uh, and four of the women did not give consent to be included in the list of alleged victims. Yeah, this kind of organization, you don't want your name known. Let me see, what else do I want to, to look at here? Um, so what's a you know there, there's all kinds of wrangling about outside groups and lawyers, uh, independent lawyers, and everything else. Who wants to talk to a lawyer? Who wants to talk to a lawyer? Unless you're trying to sue somebody. Who wants to talk to a lawyer? I mean, if, you, if you've been... Let's say you're, you're married. And the pastor that you've been adoring for so long sexually abuses you, sexually assaults you. Do you really want that exposed for the, to the entire world, including your husband? Do you really want to let that out? Of course not. Of course not. All the shame, and then everybody in the church looking at you as like some sort of traitor, which is what'll happen. Uh, let's see, what do I want to look there? So, what's the biblical uh, criteria for uh, um, accusation against an elder or pastor or pope? 1 Timothy 5.19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. So the only credible evidence that's required is two or three witnesses that were personally sought or were personally victims. Eyewitnesses. That is what you need, at least two, at least two, at least two. And they don't have to be to the same event. I'm sure there's people out there that spin it. And what happens is, and I think it happened at, yes, it did happen here at uh, IHOP. In the local church, when this came out in the newspapers, because the guy got convicted and sent to prison, and again, it wasn't, and it was, it was uh, sexual uh, assaults that took place including on school property and this was quite a few years ago though you know, uh, uh, like like four years prior and the pastor wasn't involved but he was there in the schools under his authority so he had responsibility and did not apparently there was there was uh, concerns brought about uh, stalking how come this uh, the school principal keeps driving up the alley by our house in the middle of the night. Things like that. Things that would raise questions. And he failed to, uh, to pick up on it, and eventually the victim 
Of course, there's usually more than one victim. Uh, after suicide attempts revealed it, while he was safely away, apparently this guy had been trying to get him to come to, from that school to the school where he was, was currently serving to get him a transfer there so to continue the relationship. <sighs> so for a born-again uh, Christian, a fundamentalist Baptist, that's the kind of school this is, to confess to having been involved in any of this, even if as a victim, uh, would bring you lasting shame. I don't think these churches are usually very good at handling these circumstances. And I, I, the first church I joined after being born again was a fundamental Baptist church where the previous pastor had run off with the secretary, leaving a husband and a wife behind and children. And that wounded that church, and I don't think it ever got over it. it no, it did. They were a hot shot. This is a hot shot pastor with a multi bus ministry. It wasn't a huge church, but and a lot of debt and build a school and everything else trying to imitate uh, the, the church at uh, the Hiles, uh, where Big Shot Baptist Church up at uh, uh, near sh south of Chicago there, Indiana. And uh, then he runs off with the church secretary. And that was devastating to the church, the congregation. That's why I'm doing this, because I've seen the, the fallout from this kind of thing. Uh, and how painful it is and how it, it devastates the church because these people have been following somebody and trusting him and everything else and listening to his words, and then they do things like this. Two or three witnesses. I suppose some people say, well, there was eight witnesses, so it doesn't count. Twisters of the Bible. So let's go back to this article here. The report also claimed the document presented by the complaint group didn't contain any actual evidence, like victim statements, emails, or texts, but rather it's only blank squares acting as exhibit placeholders. Okay. A preliminary thing like this with victims that don't want to be identified publicly, don't want to be publicly shamed, don't want to be publicly attacked by the church, because that will happen. That will happen. If you attack the church's idol, uh, I mean pastor, who all these people worship and adore because he is the very voice of God to them, you are Satan, and they will treat you as Satan and harass you and smear you and do all kinds of things. It'd be like, they act like the Democratic Party at times. Actual evidence. Accusations by two witnesses is sufficient. To hear, of course, again, this is, so when it talks about do not receive an accusation, that does not re mean re not listen to an accusation unless there's at least two people accusing you at one time. No, that means you don't accept it as solid as a factual uh, accusation unless you've had at least two accusations. You understand what I'm saying? One person making an accusation against a pastor is not sufficient to boot him out unless he confesses, you know. But it's uh, so, but if there's, you've got two witnesses, this is the Old Testament criteria, too. You had to have two or three witnesses to, to execute someone, to put someone to death for a capital offense. Two or three witnesses, not people that heard rumors of it. Witnesses, eyewitnesses, people that saw it. Which in sexual assault, you're not going to have two or three witnesses usually to the actual assault. But that's why here it's talking about two or three uh, accusations. So if you have one event and another event, you better be listening to what's going on. Something's going on. Credible 
witnesses, uh, taking the pastor's word over a, a Christian in the church would be uh, a wicked thing to do. But it, the thing is, because some people uh, take offense at someone, some people will make false accusations. That's that that has that possibility. You can't just take one person at their word, uh, which is you've got to be just to everyone. Uh, Dwayne Roberts, a founding member of IHOP's Kansas City and a member of the so-called complaint group, so this is a, a founding member of the of the church thing, called the IHOP KC report disappointing on several levels in a statement uh, submitted to the Rice, Rice's report. Uh, this guy, apparently, uh, once upon a time was... We are fully, in other words, this, this could be someone that was known by one of the, uh, the um, victims uh, from some time back. So you would, you would go to someone who you could trust and who was not going to smear you and out you and destroy your life. We are firmly convinced that no charge should be made against an elder except in the case of two or three witnesses. Eight Women, eight women. Yeah, you, they, they won't come forward publicly because you will we'll smear them. Uh, that's they destroy their lives. That's how you. How do you handle something like this? Well, that's a good question. The fact that around twenty witnesses have come forward with firsthand experience of impropriety was why we could no longer remain silent. So there's twenty witnesses. I assume that these eight might be like. Uh, Sexual uh, intercourse type things, not just fondling or inappropriate touching or suggestions, but you know, a serious, serious stuff, really serious stuff. Roberts uh, specifically took exception to the report's claim that victim number two had partial credibility. If you've got eight, 20 people coming forward with complaints, this is a serious issue. This case, uh, case includes a relationship between a 42-year-old internationally renowned minister and a 19-year-old relationship that began with prophetic manipulation. Oh, Lord, this is a pattern. And became a four-year sexualized relationship that lasted into the early years of IHOP. According to the report, the complaint group uh, first approached IHOP on October 24, with accusations against Spickle, the report added that the group did not and has not claimed that these women uh, had ever previously made their allegations known to IHOP prior to October 2023. There's a reason why. Fear. Fear. Not just shame. Fear. In these kind of churches, fear. Just like in MacArthur's church. Fear. Now, I'm not saying MacArthur was ever accused of sexual uh, stuff, but there have been other kind of accusations there, including uh, essentially verified by the outside uh, group that has to do with the um, the what do you call it the not the certification but the accredit accreditation of the college and seminary. They said MacArthur cannot remain as head of those institutions. Uh, atmosphere of intimidation. Toxic atmosphere, the group reported. And they were just there to, to look at the school as far as uh, renewing their accreditation. Not coming in to investigate something, I don't think. But there apparently were numerous uh, reports of this kind of stuff there. IHOP KC said in its report that it, it took the allegations against Bickle very seriously and within 24 hours began looking into the details and asked Bickle to step away from public ministry. However, the report claimed that the allegations came with a list of pre-prepared demands to prevent escalating levels of disclosure. Yeah. Yeah, the victims don't want to be publicly outed and attacked. Who knows what would happen uh, in this kind of a church of uh, this size, there's people out there that are 
um, this is a non-rational religion. This is a fringe charismatic group that the, the leadership is the voice of God. Mike Bickle is the voice of God to these people. His words, not the Bible. Bickle is not, uh, does not abide within the, the restrictions of the Scripture. He is the Word of God. That's what these charismatic churches are, uh, often like this. They, th th these ministries are built around a particular individual, a charismatic individual. And that person is the center of it. Uh, uh, the same thing in the, the Fundamentalist Baptist Church up uh, in Indiana. That particular preacher uh, was the center of that ministry and, the, the, and, and his others around him, his family. And they, everybody was looking to them instead of looking to Christ and to Christ's Word, to the Scriptures. And that's what happens. See, when somebody like me goes into one of these ministries, I can remember one small ministry, a youth ministry, uh, that sort of got into the church stuff a little bit. But I would say, but the Scripture says, I was a thorn in their backside because they would be doing these things. And I'd say, but the Scripture says this, because I'm uh, the Word of God. I'm bound to the Word of God. And that, that kept me safe from getting too far into this stuff. But if you don't have that, then you become worshipers of people like this. He becomes your, your, uh, your mediator with God. And spiritual abuse, not just sexual abuse, but spiritual abuse among Pentecostal and charismatic uh, movement has a very deep and wide and long history. It's not odd at all. It is more or less the, the standard. Uh, these demands and threats, which include dictating the use of IHOP KC funds, so this is the response of the church to these accusations through a, a person that is sort of acting as a, uh, a shield for them so they can tell their story basically without being destroyed. Uh, dictating the use of IHOP funds generated an atmosphere of concern concerning the true objectives of the complaint group. Uh, well, I'm sure they're very paranoid about the complaint group too. The report added, upon review by outside legal counsel, well, what do you hire outside legal counsel for? To cover your own backside. That's what you do. You bring in lawyers, what? To protect you. They're not interested in the accusations. They're interested in protecting the ministry and protecting Bickle. That's why you bring in lawyers. When there's accusations against you and you call the lawyers, they're not there for the benefit of the accusers. It was determined that the collection and uh, presentation of the allegations by the complaint group lacked any semblance of re reliability or due process. The lawyers for IHOP and Pickle. Duh. What are they going to say? They're hired as legal defense. To, their, their, their job is to protect their client, not to do justice, to protect their client by whatever means it's necessary and legal. In his statement to uh, the Royce Report, Roberts contested the timeline in the report. Uh, is that the legal, that must be the outside legal counsel, perhaps? The statement that the executive leadership uh, team had officially notified on October 24th about these allegations is also untrue, Roberts said. While it is true, uh, true that the meeting took place on the date and more information was given, key members of the ELT, the executive leadership team, were officially notified on November 9th, and IHOP executive director Stuart Greaves told me that the whole ELT was form, informed on o October 10th. Roberts added that many of the allegations have been communicated over the prior 18 months in a ad hoc manner. 
So these allegations, many of these allegations have been communicated over the past year and a half. And stonewalled, apparently. IHOP says hiring a third party to investigate is premature. Yes, we have to destroy the evidence first or destroy the accusers. That's how this stuff works. IHOP Kansas also stated in a letter posted yesterday, there's a link here to the letter apparently, to its website that hiring an outside party specializing in church abuse to investigate is premature. Now, it's only been 18 months. <laughs> Eventually, these victims will die of old age. IHOP has heard the demands to bring a third party in uh, to investigate the organization in general, but this step is premature until IHOP KC can establish the credibility. IHOP KC, the employees of Bickle, established the credibility of the allegations and genuine intent of the complaint group. In other words, uh, uh, they are casting aspersions on the on the uh, group that is, has brought these complaints to the church leadership. We don't know why they're doing this. Oh, there's only been 20 women. <sighs> IHOP initially hired a national law firm, Stenson LLP, to investigate the allegations. No, they to, to cover their butts. That's what you hire a law firm. What's the purpose of the law firm? To serve their clients. But it changed course last week and instead hired a local lawyer, which it refused to identify. So perhaps the law firm Stenson LLP was telling them things they didn't want to hear, and uh, they decided to fire them and. Hire someone more local and supportive who shall remain nameless. A, petitioning, a petition circulating online which had garden, garden, garnered over 3,000 signatures is urging IHOP to hire Grace, godly response to abuse in a Christian environment. I, you know, there's something funky about that too. Uh, the name of the person that, that started that is, con believe is connected to the to the guy that took over the ministry of D. James Kennedy uh, down there in Florida, and he was involved in sexual abuse too. This isn't the person, but it might be a brother or something like that. Uh, it, uh, Boz, uh, I can't even pronounce that name. But uh, the so an attorney, but that's the last name of the guy that was involved in following D. James Kennedy, and he was involved in a scandal too. So the last name, which is an unusual last name, Grace's founder is so. Uh, I wouldn't trust a group like this because it's really godly cover up of abuse. Uh, you have to handle it biblically, and th these people are not. They are not uh, elders in a church or pastors. Uh, I would say the way for these women to handle this is to, you know, like a, well, I don't think it would maybe work, but maybe a, a non-charismatic local church, small. Uh, if, if a pastor was willing uh, to hear this or confidentially hear it or like like the uh, the person that's already handling it uh, to, to have these women write up statements anonymously and have a, a pastor or several pastors uh, independent of each other examine the statements and see if it's uh, as credible enough that it requires more you know like legal stuff or criminal stuff <laughs> Uh, because obvious nowadays too, if a person in authority like Bickle were to sexually abuse a member of the congregation, that could come under rape because of the dominant position uh, in, in legal theories of rape nowadays. 
it's it's uh, because the person, even if it was so-called consensual, if it's a that kind of a situation where you have a charismatic mega pastor, and you know, besides, in these cases, often these people, in fact, one of the uh, colleagues of of uh, this guy, um, Bickle. His name was, what was John? Yeah, we'll probably run into it. Let's see. Yeah, there was two guys. Uh, Paul Kane, he was a false prophet, a drunkard and a homosexual that was a super prophet in the uh, charismatic world. Uh, he was associated with, with Bickle. And there was an, a Bob Jones, Bob Jones, another false prophet of the Kansas City Prophets, Bickle was part of a group prior to IHOP called the Kansas City Prophets. And it was Bickle, Kane, and Jones. And Jones was sexually abusing women. They had to appear once a year to pass under the shepherd's rod. This, this, is, this is how fringe these people are. So th- these are really flaky, strange people and very abusive. And they had to appear naked before the prophet and pass under their rod. And then he would anoint them internally with something. And again, Bob Jones was a very close associate with Mike Bickle. And Paul Kane, the super prophet of the charismatic world, again, the super false prophet, uh, did he die of alcohol or he died of AIDS? I can't remember which one. But yeah, he was a, a longtime homosexual and a drunkard. Seems to go with the territory, from my point of view. And I was in this movement, but I never got into this stuff. I always said, no, this is too far out. This is too far from the scripture. The charismatic movement didn't start like this, by the way. The charismatic movement started quietly a renewal movement in mainline churches like the Episcopal Church and Lutherans and others. And in those cases, the, the pastors was were under denominational authority and they weren't these mega super prophet guys. You know, these, these people that call themselves apostles and prophets, that's what this kind of stuff like Bickle and uh, Paul Cain or, and Jim, or Bick, uh Jones. Uh, I was going to say Jim Jones, but no, that's uh, Bob Jones. Jim Jones was the same kind of guy, too, by the way, of the uh, Kool-Aid fame. So this is what's going on here. Now, I want to talk about this. Michael Brown steps down as an advisor. Michael Brown is the great fixer of the charismatic movement. When scandal shows up, Michael Brown comes in there and tries to blur things over, fuzz it over. And, oh, we can't do this. And that can't. Not, I'm going to show you here. This, this is early on. Now, this is uh, dated uh, when? Three weeks ago. So this is, I'll go play it. This is Michael Brown always steps into these things and tries to. Uh, obfuscate, blur, smokescreen the uh, the events in his in his in his way. He, he seems like a very rational kind of charismatic, but in fact, uh, he's he's pretty wild <laughs> on occasions. Fire, fire, fire! There's videos out there about him. The Brownsville revival. He was right in there. Uh, on the strange side. not Never very good at actually anointing people with the Spirit, though. <laughs> By the way, that was not the Holy Spirit. And the Brownsville Revival, the the uh, I've told the story before of uh, a, a large church in, was it Mission? Mission, Texas. Uh, what did they call that thing? I can't, it doesn't matter now. Uh, it'll come to me, but it was a large church and was founded by, one of the founders of it was the, the head of the missionary school I was going to. But they were supposed to have a, a revival going, so I went over there to see this stuff. 
and uh, I didn't think it was a revival at all. But the, the uh, they brought in a, a new music leader, and I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't part of this thing. And when I saw him, I had this utter sense of revulsion in me. It was like, and I'm wondering, what is wrong with me? I can't stand this guy's guts, and I've never seen him. Just had this inner, just, just crushing, just utter distaste for this man. Just a music leader. I didn't know why. What's wrong with me? And then several years later, it comes out in the local newspaper. He had he was uh, abusing uh, young uh, boys, uh, teenagers, and plying them with alcohol and, and drugs in exchange for sexual favors. And this guy had been recommended by the pastor Kirkpatrick at Brownsville, which is the Assembly of God. Uh, at the revival, t as a music leader that should go over to this church, Trinity Worship Center, uh, in Mission, Texas, and uh, turned out he was a pervert. You'd think these charismatics would have a spirit, uh, discernment of spirits, wouldn't you? They don't. They're spiritually blind. That's why this stuff goes on. There is no spiritual discernment there at all. So let's play this a little bit. Oh. I don't want that. That will cause problems. Change my audio here. So he's responding to concerns about this. Your heart sinks and you think the worst. So these were close friends who had heard from other close friends saying, we just want to give you a heads up of, of what's coming down. And then... Uh, by, sun by later in the day, Saturday, this was all over the internet, and then Sunday morning, the uh, leadership of IHOP KC had to address things. So this is a statement that was... Uh, so, in other words, uh, um, Michael Brown is fairly close to IHOP and Bickle, common. They, there's a sort of like this club of, of apostles and prophets. And Michael Brown is part of that group. Our groups are they're not normally an official group, but yeah. Read by Stuart Greaves, whom I know not closely, but I've, I've met. We spent some time together, uh, one of the senior leaders at, at IHOP. So listen to what he had to say, and then I'm going to weigh in uh, as if the charges were true. We don't know yet. They're, they're very credible charges and serious charges. We don't know the details, and there must be due process that's important. And my hope— I notice the books he's hawking on the background. I'm sure they're all written by Michael Brown. Revival or we die. Well, uh, the revival at Brownsville died. Is that IHOP KC will bring in outside leaders or even a, a, a ministry that, that does official— investigation so that this can be done above reproach that that's what i'm, I'm hoping too late for that done, rather than just handled eternally internally because it's it's very big and the ministry is very big and it's interesting no, no, you, the, the above reproach has to be the minister the teacher the the elder he has to be above reproach not the investigation the man himself or woman has to be above reproach that's one of the qualifications for being an elder or a deacon. Must be above reproach, not only in the church, but also in the community. International and many eyes are on it. So this would just bring greater accountability. I'm going to respond, though. If the charges are true, then what do we do with this? How do we respond? But first, it's about a two minute, 20 second statement that we'll hear from Stuart Greaves. This is a statement from the IFKC leadership team regarding allegations against Mike Bickle. We are heartbroken to share that we recently became aware of serious allegations of sexual immorality directed against Mike Bickle, the founder of IFKC. Our leadership team takes these allegations very seriously, and we are laboring for truth, light, redemption, and righteousness. We are engaging with outside parties to assess. Let me make a point. There is no redemption for ministers that fail. 
this way, uh, they are permanently disqualified from public ministry because they have to be of good reputation. The husband of one wife. Not given to greed or drunkenness. Not uh, pugnacious, but they have to be of good reputation. And once something like that ha this happens, they are permanently disqualified because they don't meet the requirements, the qualifications as a elder or a deacon. So there is no restoration to ministry. No. No, there isn't. Such a person is unqualified to be an elder or a deacon. Forever. And arbitrate these allegations. Our priority is to love and serve the IFKC community during this moment. This news is unsettling for our spiritual family as well as our entire leadership team. Please pray for all involved, including the ones who have come forward. Though Let me point out that these are not congregational churches, just like MacArthur's church is not a congregational church. The Christians have no say. The Christians of the church have no say in their church. It is the leadership team. Just like MacArthur's church, that's one of the problems out there. It's a serious problem. Uh, the Catholics have this problem, too. You get a, a bad priest, and they're pretty much— the only recourse they have is stop giving money to it. That is the Christian's leverage. Don't behave. No money for you. That is the— uh, uh, there's there's nothing in the Bible that says you have to keep giving money to rogues and pirates and thieves. You're foolish if you do. You're not serving Christ. If you fund those that are responsible for for uh, bringing shame and reproach upon the name of Christ, well, then you're enablers and co. Uh, you're guilty with them. Those who have experienced trauma and for the Bickle family. And if you're aware of what's going on, let me add that. We are asking for your patience as we work through this complex and very difficult situation. No, it's not. Are the allegations true or not? Are there two valid accusations of serious sexual misconduct, which comes under adultery. And from what I understand, it had to do with, the aid had to do with things that were, that broke the marriage covenant. In other words, these are acts of adultery. Secondly, we asked our spiritual family to refrain from using prophetic spiritual language that can be interpreted as dismissive of the pain of those who are traumatized. On October 26th, the IBKC executive leadership team asked Mike Bickle, and he agreed to not preach or teach from the IBKC platform, attend our 24-hour prayer room, or engage his social media channels while we work with others to assess this situation. As difficult as this is for many, we are trusting Jesus, his wise and good leadership to help and strengthen us as we anchor our hope in him. Okay, let me bring up another point here before I forget it. Uh, there was uh, apparently Bickle preached a sermon referring to accusers in the church as uh, related to the black horse. All right, there's a couple black horses in the scripture, but one probably meant was the black horse, the third horse of the four horsemen in the book of Revelations. That horse is the horse of famine. That a, uh, uh, what is it? 
one measure of wheat and or three measures of barley, I believe it was. What is that? That's like minimum daily allowance. So what would, how would that be related? Well, uh, bringing famine to the body of Christ, I suspect. Again, I don't know the context, but the black horse, I looked at that. Okay, what, how would this fit into that? If you're accusing people of being connected as a black horse, in other words, their accusations will bring spiritual famine to our church. That's my take on it, my personal take. So, like, how how's it fit? No, mm. So, an agonizing situation. Uh, I was on the phone with Nancy talking about this on Saturday, and I, I just had to get off the phone and weep. Uh, First, I assume that's Bickle's wife. I just said, Lord, I'm so sorry. We, we, we keep blowing it. We keep bringing reproach to your name. We? we? <laughs> oh, were you a, con- a co-actor in this, Brown? We? No, they. See, he always wants to diffuse the responsibility. Diffuse it to the church as a whole. Maybe to the charismatic movement. But to the church as a whole. We, we, we. No. He, he, he. Keep hurting you. You keep hurting your people. That's that's the very first thing I wept over. See, it's this kind of stuff, his response to, his public, this is... I I don't want to accuse him of faking it, but I wonder. I wonder. Tears. Reminds me of... Somebody else that publicly broke into tears, confessing their sin. Jimmy Swagger. And then what does he do? He gets caught again. He gets caught again. When a state uh, police officer pulls Swagger over in his car with a prostitute and a bunch of porn in the vehicle. And he went before his congregation this time, but rather than repentance, he said, it's none of your damn business what I do. Obviously not a congregational church. See, that's what happens. These people get themselves in, they build a whole ministry around them, and they become the demigods. They become the voice of God, and they begin to believe themselves that they are the voice of God. And so they're above accusation. They're following the Spirit. They don't know what Spirit is, but they're following the Spirit. See, they are not looking to Scripture. They are not bound by the Word of God. They just, whatever comes into their head, they think it is the Spirit of God. The devil must have all kinds of fun with them. Doing things like this. So, see, uh, 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 the charismatic movement is intensely emotional. Not rational, emotional. And it's this kind of stuff. It, it's fake. It's fake in, it, because it's not the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, when I see these things, I get very sad, too. But I don't weep for the, per, for the guy that did it, although, you know, it's a sad thing. And I, but I've seen what this does to churches, and that's where our compassion should lie with the victims and with the church that that's well they their faith has been misplaced into a man rather than faith in Christ himself and Christ alone see these these people always promote themselves as the source of God's revelation you need to go to the prophet for daily word and the kind of things a bickle was involved in with Bob Jones and Paul Kane, all of the Kansas City prophets were highly, highly spiritually abusive. And with Jones in particular, sexually abusive, using his position as a so called prophet. And women would submit. They would, you know, pass under my rod, some sort of prophetic thing from the Old Testament uh, and show your submission to God by doing it naked. You come before the prophet naked. 
That Talk about spiritual abuse. And what happened to Jones? Is he in prison? No. I don't know if he's still alive. But that kind of stuff is not uncommon. And the bigger they are, the more prevalent it is. Where are these, these mega leaders that haven't done something? This has happened so many times. And, and when it happens in the body, that's us. That, that's us. And it, it, it grieves the Lord and it hurts the Lord. And there's so much damage. And then, specifically, the, the women involved who would be victims here, their pain and, and what they've gone through, and then the larger fallout for so many around the world who've been touched by, by IHOP case. Touched falsely by IHOP. Now, people that are involved in IHOP are deceived. They are, they are following a false teacher and a false prophet. This whole movement, especially on this edge, it's utterly false. Again, the charismatic movement did not start out like this. It started out in side of, you know, mainline churches where you had a denomination and, uh, you know, or might, might be in a Lutheran denomination or something like that, and you've got a pastor that that is mildly charismatic and doesn't promote bizarre things but believes in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and that's about it. It's when they start believing their apostles and prophets, it's when things really get out of bounds. Because Satan, it's very, very, very easy for him to manipulate these people. Just being in the charismatic movement opens you up to, for spiritual deception. Because you believe you, you're hearing directly from God. Not God illuminating his word to you so you can understand it with clarity and you see how it all fits together better and better and better, but rather bringing new revelation that's not in the Scripture, personal revelation about what you can do and cannot do. And the thought just occurred to me of our good old friend Muhammad and how the Quran evidences how his personal revelation seem to have benefited him and his close followers. Especially sexually. <clears throat> All kinds of times, not just once. You know, what did he have, nine wives or something like that? Which the Muslims are only supposed to have four. But he had a special dispensation because since he was such a wonderful prophet from Allah, that Allah said, well, you can have as many as you want, including other men's wives, other Muslims' wives. You want them? Take them. That's pretty much what it came down to. You, you know, the guy that's giving the revelation about how Allah gave him a special dispensation to have nine wives or unlimited wives, one would wonder <laughs> where the revelation is really coming from. See, and by Mike's ministry. It's just an agonizing thing, and I, I want to make an appeal. Uh, well, what happens when you hear these things? You, you realize the ministry of Mike was serving Mike. I mean, it, it, besides the sexual allegations, this entire ministry has been utterly corrupt, serving a false gospel. It's not about Jesus Christ. These charismatics are not about Jesus Christ. There's... there's this edge of the charismatic movement, at least. It's, it's always focused on the Holy Spirit, not on Christ. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, when he comes, he will not speak of himself, but he will speak of me. He will reveal, reveal my things unto you. The Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us. The Holy Spirit doesn't focus on himself. He focuses on Christ. He is Christ's presence. He, re he shows of Christ. He shows us the cross. He gives us understanding of Christ and his mission, his purpose, his gospel, his covenant. But when people take the focus off Christ and put it on the Spirit, that is not what the Scripture does or the Spirit of God does. Fellow leaders, we got to watch ourselves. It, it's so easy True. to mess up. It's so easy to open a door. It's so easy to take wrong steps. I'm, I'm a... Yeah, you 
need to be careful because there's a target on your back. And there's Satan with his fiery darts. And people will accuse you falsely for things that never happened because they have suspicious minds. And they project their own things on others, too. But, yeah. And there's, there's strange people. There's strange people. I had some uh, uh, things that happened to me when I was pastoring. And uh, there was a young lady that was acting a little, she was a little bit, uh, oh, well, she, she lived at home with her mother. But uh, she did some things that were rather odd, and I never was comfortable. I didn't want to be around her because, uh, like, I remember one time she I was walking, and her bike fell over on the sidewalk just a little bit in front of me. And it looked like it was deliberate. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, it was almost like she was stalking me, but, you know, and it's like, nah. I, I, I just thought I need to keep my distance here because I, I've had, I, I, we took in a, a homeless uh, mother and her daughter. And I remember, uh, don't do this. Don't do that. I'm, this is a warning to you. The, the compassion can be dangerous. Anyway, somebody asked if we could take, another pastor asked us if we could take her in, and we did, and uh, put her up in a, in a bedroom down in the basement. Uh, and she was not a Christian. Never take a non-Christian into your house. That's, if they're, if they're a brother or sister in Christ, it's a different thing. But uh, my wife caught her one day on the phone talking to her daughter telling her daughter to make some accusations against me. And my wife said, get them out of the house. You know, they're, they're just making... Homeless people are very skilled at manipulating others and manipul manipulating the system. And they're utterly self-centered because they're not born again. If they're born again, they wouldn't be homeless. God takes care of his own children. So, you know, unregenerate people are exactly the way the Scripture describes them. <sighs> Be careful. Don't go around it. And don't, don't put yourself in harm's way. Uh, aware of that. We all need to be aware of that. Uh, this can happen to any of us. You know, those who, who didn't like Mike or didn't like his ministry or don't like charismatics or whatever and kind of gloat, that's a bad move. You should grieve also. Well, grieve for who? I don't grieve for Mike Bickle. I don't grieve for, because uh, regardless of these accusations, his ministry was not a ministry of Jesus Christ. And he has a long history of deceiving the body of Christ with his fake miracles and fake prophecies and fake group, his fake 24-hour prayer ministry. That is not prayer. That is more like uh, Hinduism. And you listen to the music there. It is inducing a trance state, an altered state of consciousness. They may be contacting the spirit world, but it's not God's spirit, and it's not God's world they're contacting. It is a deception. The entire ministry is a deception on the body of Christ. And if it dissolves in smoke and ashes, it will be a blessing to the body of Christ. Even if you say, well, this confirms that they're probably... It's sad, it's but it still would be a blessing. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 is a warning for all of us. Let, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. This is a time for introspection. No, it's not. Listen to the man. It, it's not about Bickle and his sin. All of us, all of us, all... So he's, this is what Mike, uh, uh, Michael Brown always does. He shifts the focus from the crime to the entire church. It's all he, he always does this. What was the last false teacher and false prophet that he defended? 
the 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 tattooed biker that kicked a woman uh, an old lady in the stomach with her, his combat boots that guy and he was out there rehabilitating him bringing him back into ministry uh, now deep six him that you cannot these people ought to have to be permanently disqualified permanently disqualified from ministry that's what the scripture says. And if somebody is living a life of habitual sin, that is prima facie evidence that they are not born again. Because no Christian, no born again Christian can persist in sin. The Spirit of God will discipline you. You will not be able to do it. God will discipline you. You don't want God's discipline. He'll put you under his shepherd's rod and beat you with it. You will be very uncomfortable. This is a time to search our own lives. This is a time to get low. Yeah, yeah, let's take the again. This is this is we must repent. The the problem is Kansas City Church. IHOP. That is a problem. The whole charismatic movement is a problem. The charismatics need to repent of their entire movement. Go back to Christ. Go back to the Scriptures. Abide in the Scriptures. Abide in Christ. And realize that you've been deceived by a movement built on an entirely false doctrine. When Jesus said to his disciples, one of you is going to betray me, you know what they said? Is it me? Is it me? Oh, yeah, th th this is really, well, yeah, we're all Judas at heart, right? We're all Judas at heart. We, we can all betray Christ. We can all sexually manipulate uh, women. Yeah, uh, I know when I was a pastor near here, there was a, a, a young woman that was a divorcee in the church, and eventually the women drove her out. Uh, because her husbands were spending too much time circling around her at the fellowship dinners, I think. Wow, things were getting a little close between some of them, I suspect. And, uh, of course, they didn't tell me what they were doing, but they did it. Uh, anyway, there was uh, she would play the piano and come into the, the church on uh Saturday, and I think I was usually over there in the basement in the office preparing a sermon, but I always made sure I stayed. I did not come and start talking to her or anything like that. I kept my distance because I know you spend too much time around someone, things can become close, and then things can become too close. So you just don't do that. You don't do that. Uh, anytime men and women work together, those kind of things can happen. So it's you've you you have to realize that you you still Christians we still have sin in our mortal bodies and we are still still subject to temptation, but so you, there's things you just avoid if you're wise at all you're avoid you you put confidence in your own strength and you're you're looking for a fall, but uh, <clears throat> to blame the entire church and go into this weeping and and crying mode here in front of the camera and the microphone. Hmm. This this is why they always bring Michael Brown in to troubleshoot these kind of problems. Yeah, he always sort of fudges the edges and blurs the picture and puts the blame on the entire church. And now it's a charismatic See? movement. That that was their immediate response. I remember when news came of Jimmy Swigert's fall about 1987. First there yeah. had been Jim Baker, and then Jimmy Swigert was mocking it, publicly mocking his fall and mocking the ministry. And I really liked Jimmy Swigert. And I'm not saying this to throw stones. I'm saying this that we learn. I, I really liked Jimmy Swigert and his preaching and his emphasis on holding. Wait a minute. Did he, ever, did he ever go to a camp meeting and see Jimmy Swigert, how he really was, off camera? Yeah, like I said, I went. We went down there one time, and that was it. Yeah, after that, I was like, no. You see, it's really easy. Beware, 
That includes me. You don't know what I do when I'm off camera, do you? Uh, so, yeah, because we, if we got a camera, the camera controls what you see. You can't see the mess in the rest of the room here right now because it's always a mess. You can't see that. You see what I want you to see. And I try not, I don't, I usually don't edit these things. I want to be as I am. I don't want to deceive you, but you don't know that. <laughs> you can't tell because I control what you see and what you hear. Remember that. Every time you watch media, uh, everything that's televised, everything like that, there's a camera and a crew, and they select what they want you to see. And it's very easy to do. And I deliberately try to avoid doing that. But that's not a reason for you to believe me. But you can spot an edit when I put one in. Sometimes I do edit a little bit because I go off on something, but very seldom. It's, I'm just too lazy to edit the video. and authority of Scripture and all of that. And I just said, oh, it's not, it's not a good idea to do that. You set yourself up above everybody. You, you set yourself up for a fall. But I remember when news came of his fall, no, I couldn't believe it. Not to me. It's impossible. That's how I felt. That's how I felt. But I said, Lord, we've sinned. I just was, Lord, we're guilty. We've, we've sinned, so even though it's an individual. Again, if the charges are true, everything has to come to light and has to be properly investigated. That's biblical process, that's due process, right? But I'm responding the rest of the show, what if the charges are true? How then do we respond? Now, I didn't want to listen to this part um, because I've seen how Michael Brown responds at every other event. It's how do we restore this individual to ministry? No. See, Michael Brown, as a charismatic, he does not submit himself to the Word of God. He does not submit himself to the Scripture. The Scripture is plain. An elder or a deacon has to, has to meet certain standards, and if they no longer meet those standards, they cannot be an elder or deacon. A man who commits adultery uh, with people in the church, in that's a particularly heinous crime. In the Old Testament, the solution was simple. You eliminated the situation by stoning the man to death. But this is not the Old Testament. But they are removed. In fact, if it's been a long-term thing, an ongoing thing, then the question is not whether they get removed as a pastor or a deacon. It's whether they are cast out of the church as an unbeliever, as an unregenerate person because their life manifests the fact that they are not born again. They are not under the authority of Christ, because the Holy Spirit of Christ will discipline them, would discipline them. They have no honor. They are, uh, the, script, the Scripture repeatedly talks about these kind of people. They are clouds without water. They are deceptive springs. They are mists driven by the wind. They are uh, they've all kinds of language for it in, in, I think, Second Peter and the book of Jude about these kind of people. And Paul talks about it, too. False brethren. They pretend to be brethren. They are not. And somebody that, that uh, builds himself up to a position of being idolized, and then uses that authority to, for his own sexual gratification against uh, maybe the wives of people in the church or their husbands. I've heard of that, too. Again, I just mentioned a, a local Baptist church where the, the uh, principal of the school a number of years ago had an ongoing relationship for four years with a young man in the school. And the pastor, I visited that church, and the pastor did a sermon about uh, uh, false accusers in the church. 
So he is complicit in this too. When you make us do a sermon like that, if there's been these inc- an incidents like that, and there's people uh, wanting accountability and wanting changes made so it doesn't happen again, and you talk about them as false accusers and enemies of Christ and everything, even though it wasn't overtly done, it was hinted at. It was pretty subtle, but it was there. It was there. And I'm never going to visit that church again. I mean, it's, I never cared for it anyway, but because uh, I didn't feel like it was a uh, uh, place. I never was, was comfortable there. Maybe that's why I was never comfortable there, because this kind of stuff was going on. So even Christian churches, you need, or it's Christian schools, you, even a fundamentalist Baptist school, it's relatively small. It's not some big mega church. It's a fairly small church, you know, a couple hundred members, I suppose. And uh, you, it can happen all kinds of places. But charismatics are especially prone to it because the Scripture is not their authority. They go by impressions and dreams and visions, and especially what the charismatic leader tells them, because he becomes a de facto word of God to the church. So if your word of God decides he wants to have sex with you, what do you do? Pretend you're the Virgin Mary? It happens, it happens, it happens because the whole movement is corrupt, because it's built on false, unbiblical doctrine. Get away from it. Get away from deceivers like uh, Michael Brown. He seems, he's, he's not as bad, but he covers for the worst in the movement, too. He never names names. He'll say, well, the doctrine was wrong. He never says the person is wrong. He doesn't point the finger where God points the finger. He says, mark those men. Cast them out of the church. But if you're not, if you're, if the, the people themselves built the church and they're in the authority, what do you do? You leave. You leave that place because God is not there. It's not his church. 